talk about cellular mechanisms of muscle fatigue. And I'll start with a brief review of muscle contraction, discuss briefly factors responsible for fatigue, I'll go into the results, and then conclusions. In the intact human, a muscle contraction is initiated at the level of the motor cortex. And The signal is then transmitted via an alpha motor nerve to uh, the muscle cell membrane, at which point uh, a neurotransmitter acetylcholine is released that causes depolarization of the membrane uh, and propagation of action potentials along the cell membrane until we get to the T-tubule. Here, the voltage uh, change is sensed by the DHP receptor, the dihydropyridine receptor, or the L-type calcium channel. This causes opening of the ryanidine receptor on the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which allows for a release of calcium into the myoplasm. The calcium then interacts with the sarcomere, which is the smallest contractile unit in the muscle. We have two contractile proteins uh, in the sarcomere. We have actin and we have myosin. In the resting state, the myosin crossbridge is energized, but there is no interaction between uh, myosin and actin because tropomyosin, a very long protein, uh, sits on top of the binding site on actin. Uh, once calcium increases, then calcium binds to another protein called troponin, which moves tropomyosin out and allows interaction between the myosin cross bridge head and act. At this point, the binding is weak. When phosphate, inorganic phosphate, is released, then we have a strong binding that occurs, and this is the phase where tension occurs. Thereafter, ADP is released, and we have the shortening step, denoted here by uh, the movement of the Z-disc closer to myosin. Okay? At the end of the shortening step, a fresh molecule of ATP is taken up. This causes dissociation of the myosin cross bridge head from actin. And then what happens depends on the situation. If calcium is still high, then we simply repeat uh, this process with uh, the cross bridge binding to the next actin molecule. And the process continues. If calcium is low, then we simply go back to the relaxed state. We define fatigue as an inability to maintain a given desired force or power output. Now, fatigue can derive from central or peripheral factors. As far as central factors are concerned, I have uh, virtually no experience in this field. Uh, as far as peripheral factors are concerned, we start at the level of the neuromuscular junction. Uh, here, fatigue can occur as a consequence of a decrease in neurotransmitter release or receptor activation. Or, uh, if we go to excitation contraction coupling, a change in uh, membrane, uh, change in muscle membrane potential, which can uh, occur as a consequence of an increase in extracellular potassium. At the level of calcium release, uh, this can uh, decrease, or we can have an interference. Uh, in the interaction between calcium and troponin, and finally at the level of the uh, uh, contractile proteins, we can have depletion of high energy phosphates or accumulation of products uh, that uh, result in fatigue. I will focus solely on the bottom, on the accumulation uh, uh, theories. I think most people here uh, are aware of the belief that lactic acid um, results in uh, muscle, muscle fatigue. Lactic acid is a strong acid, which means that at physiological pH, it will dissociate completely into the lactate anion and hydrogen ion. There is little evidence to support that the lactate anion causes interference or interferes with muscle uh, uh, 
force production. On the other hand, there is considerable evidence that hydrogen ion does uh, interfere uh, with uh, muscle performance. Now here's a classic study by Hermanson and Asnes in the early 70s where they had subjects report, uh, perform repeated exercise bouts to fatigue and they took muscle biopsies before and after the exercise bouts. If you stay with me here, these squares indicate the muscle pH, which is close to seven at rest, and we see that after a bout of cycling exercise to fatigue, the pH decreases to about 6.4. This is repeated several times, and at each time we see pH is about 6.4. Similar, similar results were obtained in another subject. So, these results uh, present correlative data that fatigue is associated with a low pH of about 6.4. But we need a mechanism. How does pH do this? Now, this is a study by uh, 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 Sue Donaldson and uh, Hermanson in, in the late 70s using uh, rabbit skin muscle fibers. This preparation entails the peeling of the muscle cell membrane and or permeabilization of the membrane. Regardless, both treatments allow the investigator to determine the composition of the medium that comes in contact with the contractile proteins. And what we see here on the Y is force here is increasing calcium concentration, and the open triangles are the control situation. We see that as we increase the concentration of calcium, more force is generated. When this experiment is done at low pH, we see that at a given calcium concentration, we have less force generated, which means that hydrogen ion decreases the calcium sensitivity. Of the, uh, of the circle here. Okay, now there are other evidences uh, or other uh, uh, lines, other data that also support the idea that pH is involved in muscle fatigue. However, there are also studies which question this theory. In fact, more than 30 years ago, we found that fatigue is actually more closely related to a low phosphocreatine content than to a high lactate content. What was done in this study was that we took muscle biopsies from subjects at rest, from the thigh, and after isometric contraction at two-thirds maximal force to fatigue. We measured both phosphocreatine and lactate. We see at rest phosphocreatine is high, lactate is low, and at the point of fatigue, which they can maintain for about a minute under these conditions. Phosphocreatine is almost completely depleted, and lactate is increased 20-fold. But the interesting thing is that if you look at the range of values for phosphocreatine here, it was very, very tight, from 1 to 11 millimoles per kilo dry weight. Whereas if you, whereas, uh, if you look at the range for lactate, you see a much larger range. The range was from 59 to 101. Now, at this time, we didn't really understand what the relationship was between phosphocreatine content and force generation. No uh, uh, studies uh, um, uh, describe the mechanism whereby, whereby phosphocreatine could uh, directly uh, impact on force generation. However, that same year, Doug Wilkie published a review uh, where he showed that there was a very strong inverse relationship between force studied in isolated frog muscle and the concentration of the diprotonated form of inorganic phosphate. In other words, H2PO4 with one minus, okay? Because there are different forms of phosphate. If you, if you look here, you see phosphate concentration increasing, and this is the diprotonated form, and you see a very strong inverse relationship. That's fine. Again, we need a mechanism. And again, we go back, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so the question is, 
is there a link between inorganic phosphate and <coughs> phosphocreatine? And the answer is yes. During muscle contraction, myosin ATPH breaks down ATP to the uh, breakdown products ADP, PI, and hydrogen. We then have another enzyme, creatine kinase, which catalyzes the conversion of ADP, phosphocreatine, and hydrogen ions to ATP and creatine. In other words, the purpose of this enzyme is to buffer changes in ADP, block the increases in ADP, and block the decreases in ATP. Okay? Now, this is a coupled reaction, which means that ADP cancels out, uh, hydrogen ion cancels out, and ATP cancels out. The net reaction is phosphocreatine results in the release of creatine plus inorganic phosphate. In other words, for every unit decrease of phosphocreatine, we have an equivalent increase in inorganic phosphate. Fine. We need a mechanism. Does inorganic phosphate interfere with force generation? And again, we go to our skin fiber preparation. This is a study by Miller and uh, Holmscher. And if you stay on the top here, these open circles, we have force here on the Y. Uh, on the X, we have phosphate concentration, and we see that as we increase the phosphate concentration, we decrease the force generated by the muscle. Okay? These experiments were done at different calcium concentrations. The lower the calcium concentration, the less force the muscle generates. The point is, under every condition, regardless of the calcium concentration, PI, inorganic phosphate, inhibits force. In order to study the role of PI in vivo, we used a genetically modified mouse that does not express active creatine kinase. As you recall, creatine kinase results in the breakdown of phosphocreatine and the generation of inorganic phosphate. So in this mouse, we would not expect phosphocreatine to decrease or inorganic phosphate to increase. Now, stay with me here in figure A. What we have here is an isolated muscle fiber from a mouse, from the foot muscle of a mouse, that is stimulated to perform iso maximal isometric contraction. On the top, we have the calcium transient, in other words, the change in calcium concentration during the contraction. On the bottom, we have the force tracing, and we see force is increased. Next to it, in B, we have the same experiment performed on the fiber from a creatine kinase knockout mouse. We see that despite similar levels of calcium, the amount of force generated is markedly smaller. Okay? Now, in single fibers, we don't have enough material to perform analytical biochemistry, so we repeated the experiment on, um, uh, on uh, whole EDL muscles. Okay, the extensor digitorum longus muscle is also from the leg of the mouse. And we find, again, in the control, in the wild type muscle, force is high. In the CK knockout, force is markedly lower. Now here we have enough material to measure inorganic phosphate. In the wild type muscle, the content of inorganic phosphate is about 11 micromoles per gram dry weight. Whereas in the CK knockout, in the basal state, in the rested muscle, it's about two times higher. In other words, when the phosphate is elevated, the force is decreased. The next question is, well, what happens during a fatigue run? And here we have the same setup. Stay with me on A. Here we have representative traces from a wild type fiber that undergoes repeated tetanic isometric contractions. On top, we have the calcium tra uh, transients. On the bottom, we have the force recordings. What we see is that there is a progressive decrease in force, and by the time we get to the 88th contraction, force is markedly decreased. When we repeat the same experiment in a CK knockout fiber, what we see is that even after 100 contractions, force is maintained 
Again, we have the problem that we don't have enough material for analytical biochemistry, so we did fatigue runs on the EBL muscles. Fatigue was also delayed in the EBL muscles. I want you to stay with me here on two metabolites here. We have phosphocreatine in the wild uh, type uh, uh, muscle. We see that it decreases from about 70 to about 10 at fatigue. Um, and we see a corresponding increase in inorganic phosphate from about 10 to about 65. When we look at the results for the CK knockout, the uh, initial phosphocreatine content is somewhat lower, but there is no change during the stimulation, nor is there any noteworthy change in inorganic phosphate. So what I've shown you is that if we increase phosphate in living muscle, we decrease force. If we block the increase in phosphate, we delay fatigue. The next question is, if we're able to decrease phosphate, will we be able to increase force? <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, this is a study done by uh, uh, Joe Bruton. And here we have uh, on, uh, on single uh, intact frog muscle fibers, here we have representative traces for a control muscle, the force in the first contraction, and after 10 contractions, forces decrease to about 90%. Now, if we follow force during recovery, we see that five minutes post-contraction, the force is actually potentiated. Okay? He called this a warm-up effect. Here, we have the mean values, uh, force on the Y, a time from uh, end of 10 tetanite on the X. So in other words, at time zero, they had undergone 10 contractions and the force was down to 90%. Then during recovery, it increased and by five minutes post, force was potentiated by about 10%. And thereafter, it continued to decline. Now on single fibers, we don't have enough material uh, for the anal analytical biochemistry, so what we had to do was to use pooled fibers. So here we have the phosph uh, phosphate content in micromoles per gram dry muscle. What we have here is 33 pooled fibers that were frozen in the basal state at rest. And we have about 25 micromoles per gram dry weight. Then we took a group of fibers, we stimulated them, or Joe stimulated them, 10 times and allowed them to recover for 60 minutes. At 60 minutes, there was no potentiation of force. And at that time, you can see there is no change in phosphate. He then took another group of fibers, stimulated them 10 times, and allowed them to recover for five minutes. Recall that at five minutes, we had the maximum potentiation of force. And indeed, what we see is close to a 50% decrease in phosphate at this point. Similar findings were observed in the intact mouse soleus muscle. What he did here was to uh, give them um, uh, 15 repeated tetani at two second intervals. Okay? Now, four minutes later, he saw that uh, the solid line is the force that it was higher, these are representative traces, than the force prior to stimulation. Okay? So here was a force potenti potentiation. When he did um, uh, a similar uh, potentiation run, but using a five second interval between contractions, here we did not find a potentiation. Force was actually slightly lower. The question is, in this model, do we also see a relationship uh, between force and phosphate? And if you just focus on here, this is the PI content in micromoles per gram dry weight in the control soleus, we have 14. When the muscle is frozen four minutes afterwards at the time of peak potentiation, and we measure the phosphate, we see that it decreases by almost 50%. In other words, when the force was elevated, the phosphate was down. However, in the group that was stimulated with five-second intervals, 
where we had no potentiation, there was no significant change in phosphate either. The conclusion, decreased force generation and fatigue can under many conditions be attributed to accumulation of inorganic phosphate. And I would like to thank all of the colleagues that I worked with over many years at the Kevin's case. Thank you. exercise and you do a fatigue run, everything changes at the same time. How can you dissociate between the different factors? One way is actually to look at what happens during recovery. And what you see is that uh, during recovery, force follows very nicely uh, uh, the resynthesis of phosphocreatine. And at four minutes post-exercise, for example, force is completely, maximal force is completely recovered. Phosphocreatine is close to being completely recovered. Lactic acid is still 50% of what it originally was. You can take another experiment from nature. There are genetic diseases in which people cannot generate lactic acid. For example, McArdle syndrome, a PFK deficiency. These people actually fatigue more rapidly than a normal person, despite the fact that they do not generate lactic acid. There are other data also showing that the effect of hydrogen ion is strongest at low temperature. Um, when we go to more physiologic temperature, what we see in fact is that the effect of pH on force is actually lost. For example, here are force recordings at 12 degrees uh, in control situation, solid line, and acidosis. At 32 degrees, you see the difference is much smaller. And here you have a plot of several studies showing force in acidosis as a percentage of control as a function of temperature. At low temperature, we see that acidosis has a very marked effect. But as we increase towards physiologic temperature, that effect is lost. And keep in mind, this goes only up to 32, whereas muscle temperature is about 35 degrees. I really don't have much experience with the with the applied uh, um, uh, part of, of the picture, but in theory, uh, the implication is that if you can find a way to delay inorganic phosphate accumulation, then you should be able to delay fatigue. Having said that, I think in the 70s there was a group of uh, people using uh, oh, what was it, beta. It was a creatine analog, beta GPA feedings. And what they could do, what they found actually, was that they would do, there's a drawback to that, in that they depleted the phosphocreatine content, but at the same time, you block the increase in phosphate because the enzyme didn't, CK, creatine kinase, couldn't recognize beta GPA. So, in theory, there could be some sort of diet manipulation that you could do, but there's a drawback. Nature is smart, and every time you try to fool her, she ends up kicking you in the behind. There was another question? For the sake of time, I'll pass. Oh, no, go, are you sure? Okay. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.